Since the 1950s, the food system has undergone a huge transformation here in the UK. Back in 1950, households spent about 40% of their income on food. Today, it's about 10%. The average uh, head of a household spent twice as much cooking as they do today. And the food and drink industry during that time has really become an engine for growth for the UK. It's actually the um, main source of manufacturing uh, in the UK now, and the hospitality industry is the fourth biggest industry in the UK. But whilst there's been clearly many positive changes to the food system, there's clearly been a number of negative changes. I mean, here in the UK, uh, three in five people are now obese or overweight. And if we think about the environment, uh, the food system now accounts for uh, about... It's the number one driver of deforestation. It's also the number one driver of uh, water pollution. It's the number one user of fresh water. And from a greenhouse gas perspective, it accounts for 24% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And at the World Resources Institute, we estimate that by 2050, if business as usual continues in the food sector, it could account for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So we really believe, and I believe, that now is the time for a second transformation of the food system, a transformation that not only makes us more prosperous and healthy, but is good for the environment and specifically helps us tackle climate change. Now, there's clearly many things that we can do, and, and at WRI with the World Bank and the UN, over the last seven years, we've been mapping out the full set of solutions that can be done. But one that jumps out to me that I want to talk about this evening is about shifting diets, is about changing the types of food we eat. Because I'm sure many of you uh, know that different foods have different impacts on the environment and on climate. This, this here is a chart um, from one of our recent papers that just shows the greenhouse gas emissions per gram of protein for different food types. And what you can see on the right is that beef and lamb has a significantly higher greenhouse gas emission than other forms of meat, but especially plants. So as we model this out, we think that changing the proportions of uh, people's uh, food in their diet to having less meat, especially beef and lamb, and more plants is actually one of the most uh, impactful strategies that can be done in the food system. So that's great, but I suppose what's... You're probably thinking, well, I've heard this before in health conferences. The idea of getting people to eat plants is not a new one. There's been loads of information and education campaigns over the years to try and get folks to do this, be that labelling, dietary guidelines, or campaigns. Um, in particular, say, the five-a-day campaign. That's clearly been around a long time. And in places like Wales, they just did an analysis of it. Uh, during the period it ran, it slightly increased fruit, but it actually led to a decline in the amount of vegetables people eat. So clearly, if we're going to have this second transformation of the food system, clearly we're going to have to transform the tools and the approaches that we use to influence and evolve people's diets. Now, you might be re thinking, well, why is this guy up there talking about food when we're talking about neuroscience and psychology? Well, the reason I am is that uh, we believe that actually it's a real source of inspiration and insight for not only why things don't work, but can also give us glimmers of hope and insights about what could work. And so um, just in that spirit, I, th I thought I'd share a couple of, of things that I found particularly helpful as I've thought about this new approach. Um, the first, as I'm sure of those of you who are uh, readers or interested in behavioral science will know, is uh, a number of years ago, a professor, Daniel Kahneman, uh, came up with a theory that outlined how we make decisions. And he proposed that when we make decisions, it's typically in one of two modes, one of two systems. System one is when we're making decisions very quickly. We do them intuitive. They're those ones that we almost do habitually, that we don't really think about. They almost happen on reflex. And then there's a second form of decision making, which is much more considered. It's much more effortful. It's much more analytical, and it's slow. And what I think is interesting is when you reflect on your day-to-day -day experience with food, is how often are you slow, methodical, and analytical? Typically in a supermarket, uh, your decisions are about three seconds in front of a uh, fixture. And some analysis has shown that when we sit down in a restaurant, typically we make decisions in just 21 seconds what we're going to order. So in the context of that, giving people detailed, heavy 
information just isn't going to cut it. We really need to think about how do we work with people in this fast decision-making mode? How do we change the environments around them? How do we change norms? And how do we enable consumers to fast-cut decisions to the right kind of things that are good for their health and the environment? So what Whilst behavioural science can help us diagnose, I think, it, as I said, I think it can also give us glimmers of hope. So over the last four years at the World Resources Institute, with a team of behavioural scientists, experts in marketing, and a group of leading businesses, we've reviewed about 4,500 behavioural science and uh, papers, uh, uh, academic papers in this area, and we've interviewed over 100 people from the industry. And what's interesting is, as we've done that, we've not found there's not just one strategy, two, three, ten. We've actually found there's 56 different ways that we could actually begin to influence people's choices. We actually just um, published this in February. Here's the paper. It's uh, free to access. Uh, please, please feel free to, 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 to download it. And what's interesting is, you can't quite see it up on here, but we actually then asked another 100 experts to take all 56 strategies and tell us which they thought were the most effective, uh, they thought the most impactful, and also were the most feasible. And they told us there was about 20 different strategies. And these 20 different strategies range from working on the product, from changing placement, presentation, promotion, and engaging pe the people who serve or either retail food differently. Now, I don't have time to kind of go through <laughs> all of the 20 here, uh, so let me just give you a flavor of three of them. Uh, one of them, which we've actually done a lot of work on uh, in particular, is changing the language and framing of plant-based food. We found that just by calling something vegetarian, you halve the number of people that choose it on a menu. But actually, if you talk about flavor, provenance, taste, actually you can significantly increase the number of people that choose those dishes. We completed an experiment with Sainsbury's in their cafes last year. We took their meat-free sausage and mash, renamed it Cumberland Spice Veggie Sausage and Mash, increased sales by 76%. With Panera, a huge uh, 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 cafe chain in the US, we took their low-fat vegetarian black bean soup, uh, and we called it Cuban Spice Black Bean Soup, increased uh, sales by over 13%, just with one simple change. Another experiment that came out recently is about changing the defaults for how you offer people food. An experiment was done in Copenhagen with a series of conferences. Before people came to the conferences, they got uh, an email inviting them to choose the food. But rather than the construct being, um, here is the menu, if you'd like a vegetarian, please tick this box, it was the other way around. If you'd like a meat-based option, please tick this box, 70% of people went on to choose the vegetarian options. Um, and a really fascinating experiment here in the UK was done by Cambridge University. They took a series of their colleges, and what they did was they actually doubled the proportion of vegetarian dishes and in turn increased the, num the sales and the proportion uh, of vegetarian dishes by 70%. So what I find super exciting is when you use behavioral science and neurology and you think about how people work, we can begin to see these results. But for me, this is just the tip of the iceberg because when you bring these things together, what we're finding is we're able to transform uh, food choices to where they should be by 2030 within a couple of years. Just one example, a burger chain in uh, Sweden called Max Burger, awesome place, 150 different sites. Within three years, through implementing a suite of different changes, they've reduced their red meat sales from 89 down to 60%. Their sales of vegan and vegetarian dishes from 2 to 27%, all, all while increasing their profitability. Now, I suppose just to close is research is fantastic, but if we just go, oh, that's nice, and we don't do anything, the world isn't going to change. So what we've done uh, in partnership with a series of other NGOs like the UN, Sustainable Restaurant Association, uh, Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, is we've launched a program last year called Cool Food. And basically, this works with organizations that serve food, either restaurant chains, hospitals, universities, schools, or even workplaces, um, to help them set a target on changing their food, and then we bring the body of behavioral science to them to be able to shift their habits. Um, we're only a year old, but we have about 40 organizations on board, collectively serving 850 million meals. It includes uh, companies like IKEA, Hilton, uh, workplaces like Bloomberg, Morgan Stanley, universities like Harvard, Cambridge, etc. Um, and our ambition is that 
by 2022, we have 10 billion meals that we'll be able to bring this behavioral science to directly change people's habits, to help pioneer and drive this transformation in the food system, but really also demonstrate that with the right use of behavioral science and the right use of neuroscience, actually, we can start really transforming our economy at large.